Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure to have this particular session here. Thank the organizing secretaries and the organizers for this particular session. Uh, so the first question goes something like this, what we thought that uh, we will uh, try and seek the questions from the audience, but yes. Uh, what is your opinion of uh, starting an insulin in a diabetes patients when they walk into your clinic? And how, s how do you see the criticality of it? And uh, what is the importance, uh, possibly uh, acute or the long-term effects? I would leave it to the, the, the Dr. Makesh Sivaskar to answer that, if you're okay on this. And possibly if I could uh, rem remind once again that if you could able to put across the question, that will be easier for us to take the flow of this program. Thank you and what yeah, is up. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for sparing your evening times with us. And I really appreciate uh, Dr. Neeta, Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Anjali and the entire IDEC team, of course. And of course, Team Biocon here for this wonderful session that they have organized. <clears throat> Simple question that you asked, what is your opinion? Of course, there is not my opinion, it's everybody's opinion and we are all on the same page that, you know, ideally there has to be an apt time to most of, even though not all, but at least most of the type 2 diabetic patients, they will need exogenous insulin at one point or the other for the adequate management of diabetes. So the first message that I want to give it to everybody is this, that there is going to be majority of the chunk of the patients who are going to require support of the exogenous insulin for the adequate management of type 2 diabetes at one point or the time, depending on their glycemic profiles, depending on their associate comorbidities, all these parameters taken together, majority of the patients will require one day or the other the support of exogenous insulin for management of diabetes adequately. So the next question is, how early you will start insulin? Because there is always a debate on early, too early insulin addition versus when the, there is a secondary failure of drugs or OHA failures. So what is your opinion? All the three speakers, they can opine on this. Yeah, so how early uh, and uh, uh, we'll start insulin? Okay, let's so I'll, I'll hand it over to Archana. I think uh, as early as the patient needs. So if a person comes in, with glucotoxicity and a HPA1C which is high, for example, with a great weight loss and all osmotic symptoms, even if the person has type 2 diabetes, we would be very happy to start insulin immediately and we have to convince the patient that you need this. The other side is that we can always tell our patient that it could be tapered off over time in such patients. So uh, from that spectrum to a person with secondary OHA failure, where the person is not being controlled. But the point being is, how long do you wait for a patient to remain uncontrolled before you initiate insulin? So that inertia is something we have to define, be very careful about, and not let our patient remain hyperglyce hyperglycemic for a long time. So, yeah. Kulkarni sir, I will have one question regarding this. When I meant early insulin addition, I want to say it's like a drug naive patient. He has been detected diabetes for the first time and say at the age of 40. And uh, there is a, there is a like, thought that you give insulin for say few months or a year and uh, then you can taper off the insulin. So do you agree with that? Yeah, I 100% believe in this strategy. Uh, because uh, I, I got a question for everybody. If you are a class teacher, and if you have got a spoiled brat in the class, are you going to slap him? Are you going to pamper him or are you going to ignore him? My answer is I'm going to slap him. And everybody should slap. Everybody should slap the glucotoxicity, the lipotoxicity. And there are very high chances that with that two months or three months uh, of insulin therapy, many of the patients, they reverse and you can maintain their reversal with proper education. The biggest time factor is the myths and the time of the clinician. So if you take care of the first 100 days after the diagnosis of diabetes, you can achieve a remission and insulin is the, is the drug of choice. Might, everybody might have seen Satya Pe Satta. The six brothers are on one side and single Amitabh is on one side. Uh, insulin is Amitabh Bachchan of diabetes management. All the six younger ones are the oral hypoglycemic drugs. Yes, sir. Yeah. We agree with you, see. The problem is that in India, everybody is supposed, you are an endocrinologist or a diabetic, you advise insulin. 
there are next jobs. People will give Amari 4 milligram. Sir, one moment. Let me let me let me interrupt you. Sir, 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 let me let me interrupt you. Say we are asking about their opinions about what they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mangesh. Yeah. So, uh, to continue with uh, what uh, Dr. Shriram said, you know, of course there are very clearly laid uh, guidelines which have been there by the in Insulin Indian Consensus Group, which was there, which were published. RSSDI had done a pivotal work, endocrine society has done a pivotal work and they have very clearly laid the criteria as well to start insulin. But now a new idea of looking at type 2 diabetes as a cluster has started coming up. So now, you know, I had an opportunity to be as a co-author with Dr. Mohan and the team and we looked at the different clusters of type 2 diabetes, especially in the Indian subclass of the patients. The idea is not new. In the Western or Caucasian population, there are around six to seven clusters described. But in India, there are four different clusters of diabetes. Now, why it is important to identify these clusters is a place where you can really decide on which are the patients, those who are likely to require insulin at very early stage. Now, let me elaborate those four clusters to you. First is regular mild adult onset diabetes, that is called as MARD. Right? This is a majority chunk, around 33 to 36 percent of the type 2 diabetics, they are like that. But then the second largest number in the Indian population, which unfortunately we ignore, are what is called as SIDD, Severe Insulin Deficient Type 2 Diabetes. Now these are the young patients, those who will present to you with extreme hyperglycemia at a very young age, presentation like type 2 diabetes, but they are not actually, they are the severe insulin deficient, where they have lost the beta cell functions very significantly. These are the patients, those who will have a very low HOMA IR, the glucose clearance, insulin dependent glucose clearance is very, very, very poor in them. And these patients have a high chance of developing diabetic nephropathy very early. If you identify this cluster, these are the patients who are going to require insulin very early. The third one, which is called as a classical severe obesity related diabetes, which you all see, this is the third type of you know, cluster. And the fourth one is the combination of both, insulin deficiency along with obesity related. So insulin resistance and deficiency coming up together. So gone are long those days where we used to only talk about Indian class of the patients being vulnerable people because of way we have very high severe insulin resistance. No, we are also insulin deficient. Even though we know that the beta cell function is, you know, at nearly 50% down at the time of most of the type 2 diabetes with a decline rate of around 5% every passing year. But let us understand the fact that this second cluster that I mentioned are the type of the patients where we will require insulin initiation very, very early. And hence, it is very true and we need to understand that we also need to have uh, Indian specific diabetes management guidances depending on these parameters rather than blindly following the Western or the Caucasian guidelines released by the various associations. I will ask Dr. Sarada one question. My sir was asking that the next door neighbor starts on Amaril 4 milligram. So do you think that all the diabetologists when they consider of starting insulin early, will they mention this that this can be stopped or this can be reduced? Because that's what patient may be looking at, that I don't want insulin or whether if you give me some hope that insulin can be stopped. So do you think that diabetologists utter this sentence? They may, but I don't think that is the right approach. So between patient and patient, there would be definitely few people where insulin is a short-term therapy where we expect that at some stage it may discontinue, where you can tell the patient. What I feel is that patients are very sensible. If you explain the basics to them of insulin resistance and insulin deficiency, patients understand it so well. I'll just... Okay. Yes. So patients understand this difference so well that the compliance is really not a problem. I mean, we initiate insulin in so many patients. I'm a very fond user of insulin myself, early initiation. And I work in the rural areas. 70% of my patients come from farming and labor class background. And they are actually happy to 
be on insulin once they understand what it is. I often tell them the fear is not of insulin, it is of the prick. So once they realize that the medicine that is coming in, it is a replacement therapy, and that is good for them, and what are they worried about is just the injection part, not the actual medicine part. I often tell them that if you are going to take an insulin pill, would you have objected? They said no. So the objection is not to the molecule. The objection is just to pricking themselves. And once you talk about the whole injection part of it, the compliance is absolutely fine. And as we were talking about all kind of insulin therapies, people who are, uh, for example, laborers, people who are doing truck driving all day. For example, basal insulin, we had a discussion on glagene. Some of my chef, factory shift workers, they're the people who do best on such a molecule because they have less hypoglycemia. And ultimately, it's cost effective because they have, you know, uh, working days are not lost and things like that. So it's a lot about how you approach the patient and consider them sensible and explain to them, they understand. Yeah. And beautifully, as Dr. Archana was talking about, is this, let me have a show of hands of all of you guys. How many of you have tried the dummy insulin pricks? How many of you? Of course. Yes, no, no, dummy, dummy, just a dummy prick. Why I asked this question is primarily because she was talking about that insulin needle phobia. Ask your patient, to have four shots, tell him or her that, you know, fifth shot, you get a pain because of that, I'll stop the insulin and none of my patients have ever reverted back to me. It is very important for all of us to understand. So it's not probably the patient related barrier that we face, it is mostly the physician or the endocrinologist related barrier or, or a diabetologist related barrier in, in he, as, as an inhibition to initiate insulin at the right time. That's right. One of the key points what Dr. Archana ma'am spoke about is about the prick and you alluded to that. What are other key strategies that you would really put across? Possibly I would look up to Dr. Kulkani sir on this. That what are the key strategies that you would really make the patient the moment you say you need to have insulin? Now from there, you may or you may not say yes, but what are the successful rate that you would say that I would like to put these points to make him sure that he understands it and take it up the insulin as he move on? First of, all, yeah. first of all, that physician's inertia and the delay from the physician's side, we all the uh, attendees of this event, we should take it out from our mind. And uh, what Mangesh asked is the injection prick. Actually, the, uh, the prick of the blood sugar testing is 10 times bigger and more painful than the injection prick. So that needle phobia should be totally out. And you have to tell them that you are giving them the most potent anti-diabetic drug. Means it is like somebody to call for a dinner and rather than giving food, a medicine suppressing appetite, we are doing a, a perfect job by giving what is the deficiency in your body and we are correcting it. And people have got very odd ideas that it is a habit forming, it will go for lifelong, I will be dependent upon it, it is a medicine of the last stage. You have to clarify all these myths in only one sitting. Don't, you don't get a second chance to make the first good impression. So you make a first impression, you make the case of insulin so strong and tell them that a person should feel that this is the best choice is available for him in the world. Archana, please. I would just add to that, that uh, in our own practices, if when a patient is ours, patient is following with us, in the first instance also, when they are on OHAs, that is a time also we explain to them the choices and do not use insulin as a threat. One of the major factors what happens in clinic is if you don't exercise, if you don't diet, your sugar is not controlled, I'll put you on insulin. As if insulin is the villain of the story. And that is what stays in their mind, that we don't want to be on insulin. So it really helps when the first time they come and we tell them about what are the options of medications after lifestyle medicine, after exercise and the weight loss, etc., nutrition, then these are OHS, these are insulin, at some stage you... So if they have a sort of a clear view about the flow of what is available, when the insulin comes, they're not shocked. They're quite receptive. So this is something that we can build an environment with posters. We may not have time to talk about it all the time, but we can have posters in our clinic, we can have videos in our clinic, with good insulin acceptance. Another question is, 
There are two questions. One is whether CGMS is used first, and depending on the CGMS reports, you will decide which insulin to use, or you start some insulin on some other parameters, and then see CGMS as a confirmatory test. And second thing is, are there any myths about insulin, CGMS, all those things which are in vogue among physicians? Yeah, so shall I? Okay, fair. So uh, first, I'll, I'll just continue what previous question was. And, and one of the things that Archana very beautifully said is that do not use insulin as a threat to achieve compliance. That is fine. That is sometimes, you know, but there are situations where we need, you know, to be a little more insistent. Correct? And majority of the time, as Dr. Karunanidhi was pointing out, that there is somebody who is going to start somebody with a very erratic dose. If suppose you are rightly advocated somebody insulin. My strategy is very clear. I write it down on the paper that this patient will need an insulin. Okay. Even though he goes to some other different diabetologist or a physician or an endocrinologist, I leave him. Believe me, he is not going to do anything different than what you have suggested. No matter whatever and whichever the number of the drugs he or she adds to. So we need to understand that if the patient has reached that stage of need for the insulin, it is only insulin which is going to need, you know, be working and no other thing is working. Relieve him, let him experience little, you know, that hyperglycemia malaise, toxicity, feeling of being unwell, and ultimately he's going to come back to you saying that, sir, you are the first person who were, you know, right and who was right saying that you will need insulin. So that is one. Secondly, talking about CGM and insulin, maybe probably it, it, it's not a, uh, I, I would say a broad rule. It is a completely individualized decision depending on a lot many other profiles of the patients. The overall glycemia, the pattern of the glycemia, the current medications and how likely these patients are going to require a single basal initiation or are the patients or, or, or is the patient a patient who is going to require a premixed initiation that we'll need to decide first. And the simplest possible rule to do that is just look at the fasting and a prandial sugar difference. If the fasting and a prandial sugar difference is usually more than 80 to 100, these are the patients who are unlikely to be purely benefited by just a basal only therapy. These are the patients who will surely need a prandial or a nutritional insulin for the adequate glucose control. So CGM may tell you about overall responsiveness of the patient, but you cannot apply as it as a rule. You need to have an individualization for all the patients. Somebody who is not you know, following the expected path can be the patient who can be put on the CGM and then you can decide on the choice of the insulin. The next question is, there are so many insulins are now available. And uh, apart from commercial concerns or uh, the manufacturer concerns, when you want to switch from one type of insulin to other type of insulin, how you go about it? This is for all of three, all three of you. Uh, the basic fact is uh, cost, convenience, and the quality. If any organization, any pharmaceutical is maintaining quality of that drug up to the international standards, I will try to use the insulin which is accessible, available, and affordable. Right. Not only that, this is so, a like, switch from, say, uh, semi long acting to long acting yes, insulin, so yes. long acting to semi long acting, exactly. or going to premix. Yeah. So right. what will be the considerations you will have in your mind? Right. So uh, today we have a spectrum of insulins available from all the way from ultra fast acting to regular to the ultra long acting. So this is a time we can actually give physiological replacement to our patient. And that is something we should try to achieve. The barriers would be plenty, would be maybe cost, but more than that, the barrier would be knowing what to give to the patient, which is what you were saying. So I would say one of my criterias would be a good, if not a CGMS, then an SMBG at least. So when I am going to insulinize my patient in a uh, robust manner, I definitely do a SMBG, a seven-point program, give them at least you know, four to six weeks that you have to be monitoring yourself. And that gives me a beautiful clue that there is going to be, for example, a pre-dinner hypoglycemia. There is a post-dinner hyperglycemia. So we know what do they need. 
And as per the need, there may, may be people who just need one bolus or just one basil or maybe a one plus one. So what is the exact need of the patient can be decided with a good SMBG profile if we cannot do a CGMS. Yeah, simple. The, the, the clear answer from what she has said is that you need to know the glycemia profile of the patient and then you can have a choice of your insulin. And you have got a beautiful basket available. Okay, another question is, uh, there is a there is an availability of biosimilar insulins. And uh, do you find any difference between the original molecules and the biosimilars? Because uh, what are the differences in them? And have you found any difference in, say, SMBG or CGMS profiles? Okay, uh, let's first make it, a, make it very clear to majority of the people, those who are present here that biosimilars are not generics. Now take off that uh, thought from your mind. Biosimilars are biologics not made by the innovator people. So they don't have to pass through the animal model studies, the stage one, the stage two, or the phase one, phase two studies, but they'll need a very robust phase three and a phase four, and they'll also need a very robust post-marketing as well as pharmacovigilance. The production needs to be to the standards with the international match as Dr. Sitaram was talking about. The biggest advantage is this that because you don't have to pass through so many of the stages of the development, biosimilar products, they become more cheaper and affordable to the majority of the patients and we need to understand that nearly 80% or more population of the diabetic population of the globe, they stay in middle or lower middle income countries. So as he was saying that we need to have the drug which is affordable, accessible, available, both and most important, effective. So if your PKPD, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamics is similar to the innovator molecule, if your glycemic profile is similar to the innovator molecule. If your antigenicity is similar to the innovator molecule, there is no reason why we should not be probably preferring a biosimilar insulin if it is more affordable to the patient. So may I add to that? Yeah. So I take care of a lot of children with type 1 diabetes, so more than a thousand kids. And for me, it is extremely important, the safety of the insulin, the pharmacokinetics, the antigenicity. And I was always very scared of using a biosimilar. So uh, for me, it would be very important. For example, let me just say it outright, that in the generic stores that are available today, now there is Glargine available as well at half the cost. I raise funds to take care of these children, but I have not had the guts yet to use that. So for me, it is very important that I have proof, I have certification that all the parameters that Dr. Mangesh was just talking about are met. And if these parameters are met, then definitely if we can get something at a lower cost or similar cost, that is a wonderful option because ultimately that's what we want. I will ask one last question and hand it over to him. Uh, there is a entity called a gastroparesis that develops in diabetics. And once the gastroparesis develops, there is a very erratic gastric emptying. So how will you adjust your preprandial or a nutritional insulin injections? Because the timing of that injection becomes very difficult. So how will you adjust that? Yeah, so as, as you are talking about, you are talking about, you know, probably the gastric autonomous neuropathy, these patients, they do develop a brittle diabetes, isn't it? So here is probably the choice where you can have this ultra-fast acting or a fast acting insulin. Now that is the place where probably CGM will play a very, very important role. So you understand again the profile of the patient. And for there, you know, where you do not require insulin to have a very sustained long effect, you need a very short and a precise effect. Well, you've got a beautiful ultra-fast acting or a fast acting insulin which are available. And the best part is now the titration is to now around 0.5 to 1 units possible with the latest delivery gadgets that we have. So it's easy for us to, and of course, needless to say that all the insulin receiving patients must have a facility to do an SMBG. 
once they do that you know they can decide and teach the patient they can decide about the dose adjustments very easily thank you sir possibly i will I just ahead, one more point i want to add for this gastroparesis i will use a full dose of uh, uh, motility regulators like domperidone or ondansetron round the clock before breakfast before lunch before dinner half an hour before that and i will avoid drugs like voglibos which is going to cause more bloating more gaseous distension and more delay of the food over the time so if i take this precaution and then i follow mangesh uh, advice i think i am successful very much uh, we have got amit and srinivas uh, with us do you have any uh, comments to offer on this because uh, you talk today about hypoglycemia unawareness so what are the components which create a problem when the person is having autonomic neuropathy and gastroparesis sir if somebody is having autonomic neuropathy then uh, chances of hypoglycemic unawareness may be increased this is one thing also again gastroparesis can lead to delay in absorption of the food also and this can actually lead to uh, <laughs> changes in uh, balance between insulin therapy and uh, the diet so this can lead to both hyperglycemia as well as hypoglycemia both way it can go sir so it gives more food small amount of food frequently even whether to give ultra short acting or regular insulin is because sometimes that it is delayed that's what that's what you know yeah yeah so that's what the reason why i said that you need to have the smbg uh, facility available to all those patients where you can decide on depending on the profile of the patient and another thing is that you don't have simply gastro parasitic what's the patient have autonomic neuropathy is a gastric you have all other problems it's not easy. yes you are right you may need a gastroenterologist sorry yeah 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 absolutely sure thanks Thank for thanks for insulinization perfect the cgms these are best candidate for cgms yes, yes. because we were talking about insulinization and cgms because there the whole profile how long it lasts when does it dip when is that's the right person with for the cgms with the gadgets that we have available the monitoring has become little more easier that's nowadays sure sir possibly i will uh, circle back to the point that you raised uh, where you clearly underline a statement that Uh, the biosimilars are not generics so when when you see that when you see that where uh, there are other things which also is right like you say biosimilars are not biobetters and we need to no 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 you are confusing now see let us not confuse between biosimilar and biobetters biobetters are completely different group of the drugs yes right okay. they are the comp- see in a attempt to make a biosimilar sometimes you end up better. having a better drug yes that is what is called as a bio better that's so, the point but then if you have a bio better they need to satisfy it becomes a innovator drug immediately and they need to satisfy right from the animal model studies to Did the you know? human studies yes. completely so that becomes a completely new drug and it's a completely new innovation agree no because some of the forms no, no, so, yeah. so, so let's not confuse about biobetters biobetters are completely different you know different area of discussion it's yes. a completely different area of discussion i get that so i get that so possibly what i thought that i put the point is that it's been inter- some of the forums if you actually see generics they say which you clearly clarified it there's something called as biobetter which you clarified again there's something called as bio identical so would you like to put your thoughts there no, i know see, this is also uh, something different but i thought we'll clarify see, there are different terminologies which have been used you know to the to the same biosimilar bio equals bio identicals bio uh, and 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 there is there are a couple of more by different organizations like who it the concept you you know first started in european society and then it percolated throughout the first biosimilar was in the european pharmacopeia which was point taken right so let us not fall into that intricacies of the things you know they are as a whole when you talk about a biosimilar they are like similar similar is not they are similar yes they are, they are right. similars yes they are not same they are similar they is they are not identical Correct. that's the point that's the point yeah, we have question coming the last question uh, yeah in question. gdm uh, whether uh, insulin versus metformin that is 
uh, so many endocrinologists are more in favor of insulin, but patients are sometimes rather reluctant and it is a short to three months, or diabetes in pregnancy. So I think as we had a talk with Dr. Osha Sriram today, it is insulin and insulin till a situation comes in where you say that the patient is absolutely not willing. Then metformin was up till now considered safe, but there are some issues that have been seen. So unless we cannot convince a person for insulin, then metformin, otherwise insulin. In fact, sir, pregnancy is one, one such uh, sick, a physiological condition where patient will agree to whatever you say. In fact, this is the, these are the patients who are easiest to initiate on insulin. That, so don't even give an option, option to the patient also. Don't give option to the patient. Patient will come, people will Google, they will find it out. Somebody sitting in US will say something to them. You know, they'll come out with all those ideas. But let us, you know, understand the fact that, you know, that these are the patients who are most labile and malleable. And so, then some insulins are not still cleared for pregnancy and all. Yes. Now that is a different, altogether a different area. Surely, currently, the only long-acting basal that has got a label permission is uh, Detimir. your Detimir. Glargin not has passed through, none of the other. And of course, rest of the other short-acting and the intermediate-acting insulins are through for the pregnancy. So, the last question from our side that I wanted to put across is that what is the concept of this interchangeability and that's something which has been seen and yes uh, now yeah. that is a beautiful question in fact uh, that is a challenge which is uh, which is not only here in India but majority now internationally also in fact Obamacare got the highest criticism and the problem primarily because of the lack of transparency between the interchangeability See, we need to have, and if you really read the consensus statement that we have come out in as, as a CEFIS group, Dr. Sanjay Kalra, and I was also one of the authors in that paper, and we have very clearly laid down the criteria of interchangeability, and where they have, they, it has to be informed to the patient, and it has to only and only happen from the doctor's desk, not at the chemist counter. Right. It is very important for us to understand that. So your chemist, your dispensing guy should be very clearly instructed on that. And you need to understand that if at all the interchangeability is considered, it is very clearly dis discussed with the patients and the caregivers. It is recorded. And then only you are going to do it. Without informing, exchanging the drugs, without any you know, solid reason, is not ethical point and legal. Taken, point taken. That is what, what Dr. Arshina ma'am spoke about that you should spend good amount of time when you initiate Excellent. with that. Yes. And then the counseling comes in, then you need to document that. It's absolutely with you on that. Is there anything on the benefit that you would see, ma'am, on this piece when you change the insulin from a innovator insulin into a reference or the bison insulin? What is the benefit that you would see to your patients? I think if we were always looking for efficacy, we are always looking for safety. If those two criteria are the same, then availability, accessibility, and affordability are the two, three things are, that would be an advantage. But again, with the other two criteria being equal, that is very important. Point and it. hence, it's not all the available molecules, as I shared my concern. So if there are 10 biosimilars available, then it's very important to understand that which one has the right efficacy and safety. Absolutely. And, and what, what Dr. Archana has said is that that is the reason why there is a beautiful international nomenclature, nomination nomenclature which has been laid down, INN number. So this INN number actually needs to be understood well and, the, and, and all the doctors or the prescribers should be trained along with the chemists to find out the differences because even though the mo molecule may be glargine or any other insulin, but the INN cannot be same for the different makes of the glargin. So if there are 10 biosimilar glargins which are available, all will have a different international naming nomenclature. So the four suffix which has to be completely nonsense. There should be any, any letter between it, you know, X, Y, Z and all that. So, so that this cannot be repeated to the same otherwise. 
So this international naming nomenclature will play a very important role in differentiating. So if there are no other questions, we will stop uh, here. I, yeah. I have one or two questions, sir. Uh, previously, there was one theory that oral antidiabetics act at various different defects. And so it is better to give, say, multiple oral drugs so that they will correct. So is insulin uh, definitely superior to that? or Because weight gain is a problem. Satya pe satya story. Che brothers on one side, Amitabh on other side. Don't worry. Uh, for all the audience, I have got one very practical suggestion that is about education of the patient, caregiver and the doctor about hypoglycemia. Please give such type of card to the patient stating that he has got diabetes and if he is having sweating, confused, talking irrelevant, unable to talk, behaving abnormally, unconscious or having fits, he may be hypoglycemic, take him to the nearest medical facility. On the back side of it, give an identity card to the patient with the number of his closest caregiver, a relative and the doctor as a side effect, you can have a your visiting card on the back side of it. That is important. Now this is a Shravan month. Shravan Masi Harsha Manasi Indra Dhanusha Dista. So I got seven wonderful words for the betterment of a diabetic patient. That one is called as a quality of life. QOL and the second and very important is SOWB that is sense of well-being. Early initiation of insulin, intensification, adequate glycemic control will give good quality of life and a fantastic sense of well-being that is the essence of the whole discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all the panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>